2020 was the year the world burned. The seeds of the apocalypse sown on the scorched earth as in their desperation, millions fight for food and supplies, unaware they're only feeding the machine, fattening the wealthy elites as they established the new world order of capitalist consumerism with one man at the helm, Beth Jezos. Microsoft is one of the few big winners of 2020 because like shopping on Amazon, video games seem like a good call when we're stuck indoors with nothing to do. Xbox Game Pass has gone from a backwards compatibility experiment into a melting pot of first party titles, big budget triple A's, and all the other hidden gems you haven't played yet. And the true genius behind Game Pass is that Microsoft no longer needs to rely on its first party titles being good, which as we've seen in the last generation was pretty difficult, because now it doesn't matter if you got Game Pass for Red Dead Redemption 2 or The Witcher 3, or whether you get it now for Doom Eternal and Skyrim, your money's going through them. For real though, Game Pass is pretty sick, and the amount of games we've had in 2020 is kind of ridiculous. Forza 7 is one of the latest additions that if you have £3,000 to spend on an Xbox Series X, a 4K ultra wide and a driving wheel would probably still play the same as Forza 4. Microsoft Flight Simulator is another game you can spend thousands on the setup to make you really feel like you're piloting a plane because the flights are in real time. Who the hell has that much time to fly a fake plane? Every part of the Master Chief Collection is now on PC. It only took three, four, three, six years to get this game to work. And Dragon Quest XI is now finally on Xbox and PC. And if it wasn't 75 hours long, I might have finished it in time to put it in my top five, but I didn't, so it isn't. And here's the top five. I thought Gears Tactics would be a half-baked spin-off, but it's more like an excellent entry point into turn-based strategy games. Oh, I missed the shot there. Are you joking? And a big reason for that is the turns themselves. Usually in a TBS, your turn is over once you attack, which means you get continually punished for not thinking ahead. If you play TBS games, you know that that's what you're in for, but if you're a beginner, it's like getting your head smashed into a brick wall. In Gears Tactics, each soldier gets three base action points, and if you want, you can spend all three attacking. You'll still probably lose because the game is based around positioning, but you'll put up a decent fight. The story also lends itself to a gentler learning curve. There are four main characters and four main classes, support, vanguard, sniper, and scout. If one of these main characters dies, you restart. There are still a pool of regens you can take out on side missions, and if they die, they're gone for good. No, Sergio! No! But the main mission's checkpoint system prevents you falling into an early game hole so deep it's almost impossible to climb out of. That's the trade-off compared to games like XCOM, which feature permadeath, increasing the difficulty, but also the excitement of your best character maybe not making it back. The other thing Gears Tactics does differently and well is let you manipulate the action limit to obscene levels. Each class has a deep skill tree which grants various perks, many of which give you bonus actions, and combined with armor and weapon mods, you can get some huge advantages. Here's me reviewing Doom 2016 on PlayStation Now. Load your missiles onto this guy here, shoot at this uh, guy with the laser, stun him a bit, then get out the chainsaw, yeah, run right through him, that's gonna give you a big ammo drop. Um, then you wanna shoot this guy, then decide to shoot the barrel for area of effect, because it does more damage, looks cool. Then things are gonna start getting hairy, so we switch to shotgun, lay out those two guys, gonna miss that shot. Now here's the same thing in Doom Eternal. Chainsaw him through his midriff, that's gonna give me all the ammo in the world, that's still a feature. Lay off some shots, go for the glory kill, he's got no head anymore, but that's okay. Gonna go for the blood punch here, that's area of effect, so they're all dead. He just has two faces now, instead of just the one. Um, go for the glory punch, I'm not gonna switch weapons, I'm gonna set these all on fire, just get mad ammo drops everywhere, blood punch, something. That was level two. This is what it looks like when you actually understand the game. That guy has no more need for his face, but that's okay, he told me beforehand. Um, we're gonna use the grab list, drop the ice bomb down, drop down and go for the flamethrower and try and get the ammo drop, but that thing's too beefy, so it didn't really work. Um, but we did get a couple glory kills. Uh, aye aye, Captain. Uh, gonna chainsaw this guy instead of the world, because we need more ammo. Uh, dash over there. 
use the scope to get rid of the turret so he can't keep shooting me. Jump in there. Oh, aye aye, Captain. Sometimes Doom Eternal forgets how good its combat is and tries really hard to be a platformer, which I don't think is a great idea for an FPS, but I can put up with it thanks to the game's pacing. You travel at 100 miles per hour, which is pretty much a necessity because you need to be constantly moving. A, to avoid everything that's trying to kill you, and B, to plan your next step. While there are ammo, health, and armor drops on the map, the best way to replenish your three is through murder. Doom Eternal is bigger and bolder than the first one, but its biggest reward comes from breaking off these gruesome, glorious kill chains. I was convinced Fallen Order was EA's safe bet because despite how easy it should be to sell Star Wars, EA fucked up three projects to the point of cancellation before fucking up some more and just deciding to release those ones anyway. Fallen Order isn't a groundbreaking story, but what piece of Star Wars media really is anymore? A droid carries a message that if carried out will spark the resistance, although a more accurate message is keep fighting the good fight because the resistance has been going on for like how many years? Now you've got to start to question if it's worth it if each victory just gives way to a new evil. Like maybe the Empire is meant to rule the galaxy? I'm, I'm just saying. You might not care about the story at all if you're not a Star Wars fan and that's okay because the combat is this game's core. Light attack, parry, heavy attack, dodge. You know everything there is to know about Fallen Order's combat. But guess what? Now you can slow enemies with the force. Now you have another lightsaber coming out the handle of your other lightsaber and you can choose which form you use and you can move between them with one attack. I mean, this is crazy. What I appreciate most is how Fallen Order beats you down over and over again, taking away your experience if you die until you've mastered the timing of parries, strikes, and dodges. And at the top of that very steep learning curve is a massive range of possibilities. I was going to use the excuse that Sea of Thieves' range of updates make it a very different game in 2020 to what it was in 2018, but honestly, it's the stuff that's been in there from the start that I enjoy most. Pirates are married to the sea, or at least that's what Pirates of the Caribbean told me. The ocean in Sea of Thieves has that same allure. As calm and as tranquil as she can look, she's got a dangerous side that will leave you up shit's creek without a paddle. But man, she looks fine as hell, so like, I'm a, I'm at least call her back, you know, just see what's up. It's Sea of Thieves' analog mechanical nature that really puts you at the mercy of its waters. Raising the anchor, hoisting the sails and steering a part of that, but the main thing is you don't know where the hell you're going. Sea of Thieves' maps are real and tangible, they're not a UI overlay in the corner of your screen. You can see yourself on the ship's map table, but it stays there, it's not coming with you. And the island maps don't even give you that. Your surroundings are your compass, along with your compass, and by making making you constantly orientate yourself in the world, it feels really alive. All of this is amplified massively by the multiplayer. Sailing, fighting and treasure hunting naturally give way to teamwork and while there's plenty of booty to be found, not gonna make a joke, you only reap the rewards once you trade in at port. A good day's pillaging can be ruined if rival pirates want to come aboard to take whatever they fancy or maybe just sink your ship for the hell of it. I'm a straight forest man, oh god. Oh god. Oh god. <laughs> what? If that thought scares you, well flip the script. Oh. No. Oh no. You stole his dog three times, you oh, stole his chest one. Fire. And then you Yo, stab him. I'm a pirate, him. I'm not a little bitch. He's right. I mean, this is the Sea of Thieves, not the Sea of Little Bitches. <laughs> I'm constantly surprised at how well indie games express a theme, and Ori and the Will of the Wisp isn't really an indie game because it was made by 80 people, but we don't have a better word than it for games like this. So many games that try to replicate realism fail in big moments because characters look like mannequins, their expressions and body language are so detached from the situation. Now look at the opening cutscene of Ori and the Will of the Wisps.
Oh my god. Moon Studio switch from 2D to 3D models is absolutely beautiful and gives such life to the characters. They pop out from the background, layering in more reasons to explore without feeling like you're completing a bunch of side quests. So many side missions in games feel like a transaction. You go and kill a group of enemies for a monetary reward and the NPC barely acknowledges your existence. But if this adorable little kitten says it really needs to find a hat, then you better know I'm gonna go find the thing a hat. One problem with the first game was that the flow was routinely halted by combat. The lock-on mechanic meant that the best tactic was just to stop two meters short of enemies and mash X. Now you have a sword with directional inputs and you get most of your abilities from the first game within two hours. The speed at which you upgrade and the variety of abilities gives combat nuance and better blends into platforming sections which swell to these intense and dramatic chases. Oh my. Honestly, I'm struggling to find faults with this thing. Um, I will say there's a little less flute in the soundtrack. Ori in the Blind Forest was like... But Ori in the Will of the Wisps is more like... Ooh, that is some smooth oboe. Oh, bit of bassoon. Ooh, bassoon. Is that a xylophone? Ooh, the strings. Ooh, the piano. Oh. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god. I think we all really needed this game this year, even though we didn't know it at the time. Will of the Wisps lets you leave the fuckery of 2020 at the door, basking you in its moonlit fantasy setting in which you fight to vanquish a murky, ambiguous evil, but never once stray from the clear sense of right and wrong. So it's quite fitting, I think, how this list turned out. We had a genre switch of one of Microsoft's biggest franchises that got a huge recognition boost from Game Pass, maybe doesn't even get made without it. We had the biggest third party studio game and this stamp of big dick energy that Microsoft is just gonna put the best games from other developers on the service, whatever the cost. <laughs> we had the biggest EA game in a video game subscription merger that no one saw coming. The first ever game to release day one on Game Pass and another day one release, but from a developer outside of Xbox Game Studios who stated a mutual benefit for Moon Studios, for Microsoft and for the consumer. That mirrors what I think are the biggest selling points of Game Pass. First party titles on the day of release, a commitment to big games, perhaps enough of a commitment to replace the traditional way of purchasing them. Accessibility across publishers, banishing this idea that subscriptions will be a breeding ground for exclusivity battles. And good games, like really good games, and games that a lot of people wouldn't experience if they had to pay full price for them. I think that may have sounded like a bit of an advert for Game Pass at the end, but I do think the accessibility p point um, is difficult to argue against. Like this isn't a conversation about which has better games, Xbox or PlayStation. This isn't about Xbox Game Pass versus PlayStation Now. I'm just saying that subscription services, but particularly Xbox Game Pass lets us play more games from this massive range of awesome developers, big and small. And we get to talk about them and experience them together or on our own. That really does sound like an advert. And the fact that it's getting bigger um, can only be a good thing, I think. And looking back on where Xbox Game Pass was when I started this channel, um, which was the reason for starting this channel, to where it is now, um, the difference is huge. I can't see if it could make that jump again in another year, but you never know. I mean, who knows what's around the corner. Um, I'm going to be here this time next year and we'll see how it looks then. Thanks so much for watching, guys. Thanks for supporting me for this year. Um, I'm going to do another video in a couple of days talking more about that and what the kind of future plans for the channel. But thank you so much for watching. Stay safe. Have a great Christmas. No, Christmas has already happened, I think. Have a great rest of the year. Goodbye.